we at some point will be live at some point somebody will need to confirm our existence it's it's a good hope yeah um i'm i'm preparing myself for monday's interview with sean carroll uh to talk about uh many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics that is <clears throat> going to be one heck of a hard to get I've I've used this analogy just a couple of times already that it's kind of like interviewing Gandalf yeah to talk about his theory on uh I don't know summoning Middle eagles Earth. summoning eagles while yeah. Saruman has some concerns with his position and for me attempting to understand just like what how are you merry or pippin this is the question yeah. which which hobbit am i attempting to <laughs> to uh talk to a wizard about how magic works in a way that i can understand uh, oh god but we exist we did it yes and i'm i, I just interviewed bob zubrin i am worn out Oh That's, yeah, that one would be exhausting. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I've a, been on panels with him, and just being on a panel with him is exhausting. Yeah, yeah. I had all these questions. I needed to throw them out. This was not the day for me to ask questions. This was the day for for him to chew the scenery. So it was. It was wonderful. It was. Uh, it was great. And I, you know, I mentioned this to him, and I mentioned, you know, I've mentioned this many times. Like, like he was one of the original inspirations for me to just start doing my job in the first place to just to yeah. be a space journalist right it was carl sagan and bob zubrin i read case from mars and pale blue dot um and just by going through that process of thinking like i want to know more i want to learn more i want to yeah. do more and of course now my my thinking on the whole matter is a lot more nuanced and i have a lot more subtler opinions none of which i got a chance to even bring up <laughs> at all but um but it's it's uh it was great to be able to chat with him and and sort of understand how his thinking has changed from yeah when he originally proposed the mars direct plan which is still i think the the most reasonable plan cost effective way to send humans to mars and bring them like if you're gonna send humans to mars and you're gonna bring them back send a spacecraft make your fuel on mars bring them home that makes a ton of sense just please solve the radiation issues first this is all i ask like if you don't if you don't want radiation don't go that's that's his take like don't fall in no, no one's forcing you to go to mars and eat uh, many lifetimes worth of of radiation you know and and there will be a list of volunteers around the block so yeah so so i understand the volunteers around the block what has me concerned is uh, all because you agreed to die doesn't mean that the mass media agreed for you to die. And if you die, it's going to lead to like so much paperwork that no one ever goes to Mars again. Right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's the it's the complications of of, Humans. you know, if when a person goes, I'm willing to take that risk. You know, I'm willing to go and take this selfie from the top of this rock or, you know, yes. building. And then, you know, when you actually something awful happens. So anyway, um, still, uh, it's uh, and he's got a new book. If you haven't already seen, he's got the case for space. Um, yeah. And the funny part about this was like, you know, well, the case for Mars sort of blew my mind. And I hope, you know, I'm sure a lot of other people it did. I was reading this and I was like, yeah, I've heard all this, you know, <laughs> and it's and it's not like they're not great ideas. It's just like like. Like we've just been marinating in this so much for yeah. so long that a lot of these ideas are just now so familiar to us. Well, so it's a, it's an interesting time when we're, you know, as we are recording this show today, we are watching uh, SpaceX stack up the Starhopper. So with new and improved fins. With new fins, yeah. Um, I'm gonna say hi to a bunch of people. Hello to Aloha Milton, Anti-Gravity Nonsense, Arnold Post, Ben Kahlo, Bill Sugden, Chai Latte Nebula, Colin Jones, Dustin King, Giselle Sabrin, Gordon Dewis, Graham W., Greg Nickel, Guido Bibra, Harry M., Henrik Bo Anderson, James Aberson, Janelle Duncan, John Drake, John Suffield, Kevin N., Larry Beckham, Linda Sadiq, Nancy Graziano, 
uh, Ocean McIntyre, Paranor, Paul Gracie, Rich Wilson, Roman Geber, S. Wolberg, Side MT, Susie Murph, Umu, and Zapfan Zapfan. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this uh, absolutely normal episode of Astronomy Cast. For those of you who are wondering what it is that you have stumbled into, we are going to be recording our long running podcast the aforementioned astronomy cast, the one that's in the title. Again, this should not be a surprise to you, what you've stumbled into. Um, and we will take about, uh, I don't know, 20 N minutes to complete this episode. And then we will stick around and we will answer your questions about space and or astronomy. Let me know when you are ready. I... Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay. I'm going to press I'm record. I'm pressing record. <clears throat> I've also pressed record. That's it? No, yeah. No, no refusal from your computer? Okay. Well, then let's get yeah, into it. Astronomy Cast, episode 540. How do or don't planets form? Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Fraser. How are you doing? Good. There is a typo in my introduction, and I look over it every single time. It's, I, it says, and director of CosmoQuest, but actually you're the director of CosmoQuest. And I make that mental change every single time, but it's too difficult for me to go and edit the thing. So I'm just going to keep going. It keeps the mind sharp, I think is what I'm saying. It does. It uh, does. Before we get into this week's episode, is there any interesting things to talk yes. about? Yes. Yes. We have two, two, count them, two things that need to come up. The first one is on October 5th, everyone should go out, look up at the moon, and celebrate International Observe the Moon Night. The second thing is we have a new podcast over at CosmoQuest. This is the Daily Space, and uh, we are putting out short, roughly 10-minute episodes, most Mondays through Fridays that will help you understand um, the latest news. These are episodes that basically give you a quick rundown of everything you might run across on Universe Today, but uh, get the 30 second version and then go read the three minute article later. Um, and we're recording this moments before uh, Elon Musk gives his Saturday presentation on the state of uh, Starship, the Starhopper, the newly constructed prototype, which I'm assuming he will stand in front of and tell us what happens next. So for those of you uh, listening from the future, um, wasn't that something? All right, uh, moving on. As astronomers started to discover planets orbiting other stars, they immediately realized that their expectations would need to be tossed out. Hot Jupiters, pulsars with planets, we're now decades into this task. Thousands of planets, and the universe is continuing to surprise us. Pamela, I, if you went back 30 years and talked to a person searching for solar systems for other planets... What do you think they would have expected the universe would probably look like? They, they would have said with probably a great deal of assurance that it is only medium-sized stars that have planets, that the big ones don't because they have too much light and the little ones don't because they don't have enough mass. They would say that solar systems had rocky worlds snuggled up against their stars and had gassy worlds further out. And they would have said that, you know, planets might even be exceedingly rare. We don't know. But that rareness was always brought up. Right. That planets would be rare. And now here we are. Um, like I said, uh, man, I don't remember. Was it 89 when they found... So the, the peg? first, no. So the first uh, planet, 95. 
So 51 peg was 95. And then the first planet in air quotes that you can't see on a podcast was actually found around a pulsar. And that was during the 91, 92 school year. Right. And uh, so the first time we found one, it was around a dead compact object. And uh, then it would be nearly half a decade before we got to finding one orbiting a legit star that was a legit planet and it was a legit planet that looked like nothing anyone had ever predicted yep yeah um and uh totally totally surprising as you said like what no one would have predicted and and so the first problem that we had to try and figure out was well what is the actual distribution of of planets and at this point we were still thinking only sun-like stars probably have planets and and so people started doing all sorts of mental gymnastics figuring out okay so we can migrate the gas giants in if we do these things and we do this other thing and we're not sure how to stop them but we were good we were good and and then we started looking at more and more kinds of stars. Initially, we were limited on what we could discover because the way we were looking for planets was by looking for their gravitational tugs on the stars that they're orbiting, which means we could only look at one star at a time using high resolution spectra. Well, as we started to look for them using transit searches that looks for the dips in light from the star as a planet passes in front, suddenly we were able to look at large swaths of the sky and multiple stars at the same time. And suddenly we were finding stars by the dozens, by the hundreds, by the thousands. And we were looking because they were in our field of view at a whole new range of kinds of stars. And this was when we started discovering that pretty much every kind of star that we looked at happened to have a planet if it happened to be high enough metallicity. And, and suddenly, oh, oh dear, we, we had to start changing what we imagined. And, and the, the place that we didn't change fast enough, in my opinion, was massive stars. Okay, so, so let's, I mean, we'll sort of reevaluate all of those things. So now as a modern exoplanetary researcher considers what's out there and in what kinds of, of configurations. So, so let's start with the massive stars then. So before stars that power, that big probably didn't have planets. Now, what do they think they have? Well, the, the original thought was the massive amount of energy given off by a massive star would push back all the material trying to form planets and planets would not form. But now, thanks to worlds like KELT 9b, we know that these systems form planets and those planets can be snuggled up right next to the stars such that poor KELT 9b on its surface has temperatures that look like the surface temperatures of a star. Now, this is not it generating that much heat, it's it getting heated that much from the outside yeah. and it's cooler on the other side of the planet. Uh, we did not think this would be possible. And it was sort of a, I'm going to go look for an undiscovered country work by the likes of Scott Galdi that led to people looking for planets around these stars that otherwise weren't being searched. So people were like, even just not looking at these yeah, stars. Yeah, they were just poo-pooing the idea. Yeah, oh, that's no a point. waste of telescope yeah. time. Just don't do that. Yeah, don't even look. And... And now, I, I mean, I, I think that's, that's nicely reflected in a, in a spacecraft like TESS, which is just like, forget it. We're just going to look at them all. Like, just if it's a star, we're going to look and, and figure it out. Um, so, so then, you know, seeing this planet around a much more massive star, then what are the implications for that? Well, it starts to tell us, first of all, that, well... Somehow the stuff of the disk is still able to coalesce enough to form planets. And it may be that the planet formed out beyond the area that was cleared by the star's light. And uh, we have this problem of planetary migration that we really haven't figured out where we keep finding these Jupiters where we can't explain them forming there. 
So somehow they're gradually migrating toward their star and stopping before they get into their star. And, and I'm not even going to try and explain that because I don't think anyone can explain it. <laughs> Yet. Yet. Right. It, yeah. It yeah. just like, yeah. how did you get there? No idea. Yeah. But I mean, the, the time frame for these really massive stars is so much lower. Like for the supermassive stars, they only live for a few um, billion years at the most. And then they explode as, as supernova. You know, some of the in between stages between us and some of those more more massive stars. I mean, does it make sense to go looking for planets at Betelgeuse or, you know, other <laughs> like super uh, red giants, blue well, giants, things like that? So it's it's looking more and more like some planets can potentially form in hundreds of thousands of years based on some of the models that are kicking around. So you have planets working to form the same time that star systems are working to figure out how to star. And, and so you have the stars, the planets, all of them forming in a mess. And the model that we had even up till a few months ago was you have this disk that is flowing material in towards that forming star. Uh, the star lights up, pushes back, the flow stops. But in that mix, you've had planets beginning to form. And the way they're forming is small dust grains collide together, form bigger dust grains. Those dust grains collide together, form bigger and bigger and bigger stuff until eventually you start to get protoplanets and planet planets. And when it was thought, this is the key, it was thought even a year ago that when we use the Atacama Large Millimeter Array to look at these young star systems, when we see gaps in the disks around these stars, those gaps must be places where planets form because we didn't have another way to right. explain the gaps and the gaps perfectly fit what we had in our models. So you've got this situation like not I mean, the great thing about, say, Alma is it can directly observe a protoplanetary disk from any angle. And there's some really wonderful images that have been taken with Alma showing these different disks face on almost edge on at different at different angles. And, and all of the methods of detecting planets right now they really require things to be lined up perfectly. Planet passes right in front of the star, yanks it back and forth or blocks the light. But Alma, we see these records spinning in space or pinwheels or all kinds of crazy shapes and go, okay, there's planets there. And yet now, and yet there's also going to be a really hot massive star, star there, like a wolf Rye star or something really powerful. And yet you see the planets coming together and that's, that and, was not and, expected. And it's in these systems with things like T Tauri stars that when you look at them, we can now start also looking at the systems where we've identified the gaps with, with Alma. And we can start using other telescopes that look in the sky in infrared, in the colors that planets are giving off the bulk of their light. And, uh, what we're finding is those planets aren't always in the places that we thought they would be. We're finding gaps that don't have planets and, and they don't even have eddies that say there's a planet here you can't see. And this is one of the amazing things about the resolution of Alma is Alma can see not just the gaps, but in many cases, it can also see the eddies that are left behind by planets. And having found those in some places and not found them everywhere tells us that different things are happening in different places. All right, so so we've talked about one sort of whole class of stars and the planets that are, are around them. Uh, did you want to consider an, another kind of, pla of place that maybe planets were either thought impossible or uh, unlikely? Well, it, from one extreme to the other, the next place to go looking is those tiny planets or rather tiny stars that we thought had tiny planets. Uh, this is where we have systems like the TRAPPIST-1 system that is a red dwarf star that with TRAPPIST-1 is orbited 
by seven tiny terrestrial worlds. And, and so here we have our entire solar system with planets capable of having water on their surface that are probably not habitable with life as we know it because little red dwarf stars tend to go through violent youth and give off high radiation flares, badness, sterilized worlds. But despite this horrible childhood, these, these planets are, are there. And the idea here initially was there's just not enough mass to have a disk capable of forming planets. And okay, fine. So that was wrong. So now we have this idea of you have a tiny star with a tiny disk and the tiny disk forms a multitude of tiny planets. And, and we understood that and we thought that's what we would always see. And then today, after we had planned this episode, so this is a well-timed press release, I, we got news of a red dwarf star, GJ3512. This, this is an object 12% the mass of our sun, and it has orbiting it a planet that is intermediate in size between Saturn and Jupiter. <laughs> Right. This this is a giant planet compared to a tiny yeah. tiny star. Well, I mean, just to be fair, uh, the smallest possible red dwarf star is going to have say 80, 70 to eighty times the mass of Jupiter, and you've got it something with say twice the mass of Jupiter, it, it's or half, no half the mass half. of Jupiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely a scaled down version of the of the solar system, but you know. It's not like and, you Go ahead. And our, our models don't allow for a system with this mass ratio to have formed the planet through this bottom up dust hits dust hits bigger dust forms planetesimals forms planet. That model does not work. So now what we're starting to think is it may be possible to form solar systems in multiple different ways. And that is not nice universe not nice <laughs> so here we're looking at perhaps we can get these gas giants forming with these baby stars in what's called a top-down model where that fragmenting cloud of material that formed the star didn't fragment into one big fragment that spun up and formed planets around the star, but rather it formed into two fragments side by side co-rotating around each other where wow. one of those fragments formed the planet and the other one formed the star. And this is similar to how binary stars form. Yeah, Except yeah. Except now, instead of a binary star, it's a star and a planet. Right. Um, so would they have a common center of, of mass that's outside of the star? I wonder if they're yeah. going to be orbiting, yeah, a, a common point. Which so, would be... so this is similar. I, it's it's more exaggerated than pluto Charon, but... Yeah. It's it's a cool system, and yeah. but I mean, yeah, even just the idea. Cool. I mean, you know, as you said, right? You've got these these red dwarf stars. They they have this tiny amount of material compared to what a star like our our sun does, and yet when you look at say the Trappist system, there are six, seven planets, seven planets known right. so far. Um, who knows what else could be orbiting, you know, a little above or below the the plane of the ecliptic, farther out into the solar system. I mean, it is a bustling star system, even compared to the solar system. And that is, and, and when you think about the fact that the vast majority of the stars in the Milky Way are these red dwarf stars, you know, mind blown. Well, and beyond that we're only starting to be able to sample what's out there. We, we still aren't finding the Mercuries. We are just starting to find super earths, which are really sub Neptune objects that we optimistically call super earths. We don't know the full, the full diversity of worlds that is out there. Cause we haven't been looking long enough as, as you started out by pointing out, this is still very much the early days. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I would be interested at this point now, I mean, do we have a sense of like what a standard solar system looks like? Star, no. 
planets. So, That's it. So what what we have Mostly. is we we can poke the system from a variety of different ways. And as far as we know, low metallicity stars. So these are stars that don't have a lot of iron. They don't have a lot of carbon. They don't have a lot of heavy elements in them. These kinds of devoid of heavy element stars appear to still be devoid of planets. So that part of our original understanding was true. If you don't have the stuff to make planets, you do not make planets. Right. The parts of our theory that constrained little things and big things, totally bogus. We need to figure that out again. The parts of our theory that constrained how big the planets can be relative to their star, totally bogus, need to start over again. Our ideas of how a disk is able to form and move and migrate planets is really the next big thing that we need to try and get a handle on. One of the biggest questions, in my opinion, in planet forming models is how do you migrate a planet and then stop its migration? The simplistic model that we've been using is you have a disk. The very center of the disk is empty because the early star's light cleared out the center of the disk. And when the migrating inward star runs, not star, the migrating inward planet runs out of material to interact with frictionally, it stops migrating. So, I, but, and, I mean, this idea of these migrations, I mean, they actually can happen really quickly. I've heard yes. that, that you can actually move your planets on the order of tens of thousands of years. Once they're, they're drawing in material from one side of the disk of the stream that they're in, um, they, and depending on sort of where the material is coming from, they will, they will absorb it onto their body and at the same time this this induces a torque that moves them quickly but here in the solar system our planets moved outward right and and this is another one of those confusing points so when we see the youngest planetary disks out there we're looking at disks of material that are massive in radius compared to the size of our own solar system so there seems to be this two-step process where you migrate the material inward while consuming it into planets or something, you end up with a smaller solar system based on this much larger distribution of material. And then once you have all your planets in the middle, you fling them back outwards. And this isn't something that you see talked about in general. What you see is the observations from ALMA of these tens over a hundred au planetary disks then you see solar systems like the one we live in that are 55 60 au before you start running out of planets uh and kuiper belt uh and and you also see of course all the solar systems with the hot jupiters in the center and dynamically we have models for our solar system and and at the bottom of everything i say today your take-home message should be model could be totally wrong right well, well yeah and so just i mean part of this conversation is like don't we have a bit of an observational bias i mean yes. the fact that the first thing that astronomers found were hot jupiters is because they're easy to find you know if you ask me to find trees i will find you douglas firs until <laughs> until you're sick of Douglas or until you're like, fine, you know, enough Christmas trees. Thanks. I got it. Douglas fir. I yeah. got and maple trees. I can find you Douglas firs and maple trees because they're close. I, I have gum trees and oaks. Yeah, there so. you go. Right. And so they are close. I can walk outside and I can find a bunch of them for you right now. And, and so we have this observational bias of, uh, big planets orbiting closely to small stars as the capability of the tools change over time, you know, are we starting to see some kind of shift to get a better sense of like what's normal, what the new model I, might be? 
I, I'm not sure we're ready to say what is normal. I think we're ready to say that we were wrong. Right. We were just wrong. Good. And That's a start. You know, it's an important start. Yeah. One, one of the reasons that scientists do science, and I, I've said this before, and I'm going to keep saying it, is because we don't know all the answers and we really want to. These new results with Alma are going to form the foundation of here is the beginning of what solar system models should look like. Right now we're looking at a few high resolution images. We need to get to a few hundred before right. we have statistical distributions. Right. We are only starting to find planets around tiny stars and tiny stars make up the bulk of our galaxy. These are the starts and they're awesome. And we're still learning new things about our own solar system. We are, are starting to understand that you can explain the size of Jupiter's core as the result of Jupiter getting whacked hard yes. 4 billion years ago. Right. This is new information in the past few months. And, and by realizing that our our galaxy we we knew our solar system had been a super violent place we knew that we can look at the moon and see that but to see it in the size of jupiter's core to see it in how we recognize other worlds now um planetary so solar system formation is far more complex and violent of a process of things moving in and moving out than we ever imagined and i'm starting to see it like it's a really bad square dance done by children who don't hear the <laughs> color over the music very well but do you foresee that is my best modern analogy I, for planetary I, formation i'm going to need a different one i need to go back and keep 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 workshopping it um okay uh do you do you foresee this time when astronomers will have a uh a standard model of planetary formation where you give you you take the mass of the star the metallicity of the star you take the you know punch that in uh and and out comes a reasonable expectation of what kind of a planetary system you will probably find around it we we need to uh, come up with some cool constraints. These these inclu include things like you need to know the metallicity of the star, you need to know the size of the star, mass, temperature, all of that is sort of like one thing. Uh, and then going into it, you need to understand what is the molecular cloud that's fragmenting up? Are we looking at something that's rapidly collapsing because it took a hard knock or is it more gradually collapsing? We don't yet know how things like that can affect the formation rates in terms of massive open clusters end up with one distribution of, we know they end up with one distribution of stars. They have one initial mass function, but do they also have a different planetary initial mass function? Uh, we don't know how the, the distribution of planet masses compares from two different stars of the same type that formed in two different environments. These environmental effects are going to be a whole lot harder to get at. But with ALMA today and the square kilometer array coming in the future, we're going to have more and more potential to get there. And when, if JWST ever launches... It'll launch... Don't and say function. if, and it'll launch and function. Don't you say those words? It's going to happen. I, I'm, I'm going to be cautionary because I know. if I'm pessimistic, it has to work to prove me wrong. I can't wait till we do an episode on James Webb. It'll happen. <laughs> um, but uh, there is the ability in the next decade for us to get the data that is needed to constrain our models and to encourage our creativity because both things need to happen. And we will bring every part of that story to you as the evidence is discovered and the, and the previous theories are overturned and the, and nature reveals its mysteries one after the other. So 
Thanks, Pamela. That was awesome. Uh, before we go, do you have some names that you may want to say to thank our generous patrons for their ongoing support? I, I do. And Susie, you're going to have to cut out the silence because I forgot to scroll. I'm scrolling. I'm sorry, Susie. Susie, please don't hate me. Susie has so many reasons to hate me. Um, but she doesn't because she's a fabulous yeah. human being and puts up with all of my nonsense. Okay, I am done scrolling. Yes, we have some wonderful patrons that allow this show to happen and allow us to pay Susie to, to take care of us and take care of all the well, day-to-day -day activities around CosmoQuest. And those people who are making all of this possible are Matthias Hayden, Ron Thorson, Brandon Vol Volverton, Gregory Joyner, Rachel Fry, Darcy Daniels, Eric Ferenger, Kelsley Penflinko. Uh, you guys are welcome to give me pronunciations. I'm so sorry. Uh, Ryan James, Kristen Brooks, Dwayne Isaac, Shannon Humbart, Dean, Glenn McDavid, Dan Littman, Paul Veller, Martin Dawson, Russell Petto, Kenneth Ryan, Bart Flaherty, Jason Graham, and Brett Peterman. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. But not all of you. Don't go anywhere. We this show is only saving. half over. Saving. Save project. What did I say? Episode 540. Sorry for the boredom while we save. Oh. Okay, I'm oh, saved. Hold on, hold on. I have also saved. Kristen Brooks is me. You. Yes, Kristen. you. You did it. Um. All right. Each time you name it, the launch is delayed again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> James Webb, James Webb, James Webb. There. <sighs> I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not going to fall to that. I'm not superstitious. James Webb, James Webb, James Webb. It's I do launch. appreciate, well, so James Webb himself was a racist, misogynist asshole. <laughs> so, so calling it the JWST, I oh. think is more likely to not delay it. I, I think the universe is, is, yeah, this is what happens when you name telescopes after misogynists. Oh, and so people should somehow come up with a new name for it. Like uh, it won't happen. Journey NASA is set on this one. Journey Wonder Space Telescope. Uh, nah, I'm going with that. Journey Wonder okay. Space Telescope. Okay. Um, uh, Zephan Zephan is noting that XKCD predicted a launch in 2026. Any student will be pleasantly surprised. And that's a great point. Um, if you yeah. haven't seen that XKCD, um, uh, essentially, I'll, I'm going to find it. I'll show people so they can see it. Because okay. uh, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's a cartoon, but it is also... All right, here we go. I'll put this on the screen. You won't see it. Yeah, but you can give me Yeah, um, I can do this here. Actually, you can see this. There. Do you see this? So what he did was he took every single planned launch date and put it into a graph and charted the slope of the line and was able to predict precisely when he figures it's actually going to launch. That's breathtaking. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, so, so that's when it's gonna launch is late 2026. And someone's actually done this with Elon Musk time as well. Uh huh. So, so somebody has actually gone and taken um, uh, Elon Musk, Musk's predictions um, and then charted whether or not they happened on time, whether they are, um, whether they even happen at all or they're canceled, whether they're late and if, or how late. And I, it's like some, it's actually surprisingly accurate so it's something like 
Um, and I, someone, I hope someone can find the, the article, but it's, um, it's like, it's about a 30% chance of him delivering of, of whatever he's working on, be it yeah. SpaceX or Tesla on time. But if he doesn't, then there's an average gap of something like 68 days or something like oh, that. Geez. Yeah. So it's, that's wild that it's an average rather than I, I growing or something else. Yeah. So you pretty much have to like, you know, what are the chance that it's actually going to happen on time? And then it's like 30%. But then if it is late, how late? And then those yeah. have been estimated as well. But the great part is that these things do happen. There was a great thread on Twitter um, where where so much is going through all of the things that people say could never happen, right? Falcon 1, the Falcon won't launch. Falcon won't get to orbit. The Falcon 9 won't launch. Uh, the first stage won't be reusable. It won't be able to land a rocket. Falcon Heavy. And so here we are, you know, a full yeah. uh, flow methane engine won't work. And here we are a couple of, uh, probably a month away from a test flight of Starship. So. Hit us with your questions. Um, Ironheart says, is my interview with Dr. Zubrin available to watch on YouTube? Yep, it's on my YouTube channel. It should be the latest thing on my YouTube channel. Um, and is anyone relaying questions from Twitch and are we going out on Twitch? I have no idea. Oh, good question. Uh, Bill Sugden asks, could a low metal star wander through a second or third stage nebula, gather enough material to form planets? So you've got a Probably star, not. you got a nebula, the star, yeah. right. So is it because it's not going to get the, the it's angular momentum, but it's also well, not going to get, it's not going to be swirling in the same way, right? It, it's not going to be swirling in the same way, but it, it, there's just, we completely fail to like mentally cope with how, um, nebulous <laughs> nebulas are. Yeah. The, the gas in these nebulas is, uh, makes the air in our rooms look extraordinarily thick. It right. It is closer to what you get in a bad undergraduate vacuum system. Um, so the idea of grabbing enough stuff out of one of these nebulae, um, first of all, it may not have enough stuff to form planets. And even if it does, you'd have to extraordinarily slowly pass through for long, slow periods of time that system. And now you're just going to be surrounded by a cloud of gas and dust. But if it starts to collapse, is it going to fall onto the star or is it going to form planets? Well, it's probably going to fall onto the star and that's not useful for anything. Um, someone recommended that I... <laughs> I quickly check Twitter and see the state of Starship. So um, we'll just do this right now here. Um, yeah, I, I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay, good. Because my, my Twitter is like a place of despair currently. There it is. Fully that stacked is up. Shiny. Shiny. Ready to go. I just want to be a photographer there. <laughs> Well, you could you could easily do it, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of room houses to be bought outside in Boca Chica and where they're building them in, um, uh, in Florida. So yeah, but I there's no way I'm getting that close to it. So, <gasps> um, it's beautiful. That's so cool, it man. Is it really and so the the interesting thinking about this is like the these new fin structure. Have you like done some explaining on how these fins at the bottom are going to work at all? Not, not yet. So a, a bunch of people, I mean, there's people aren't entirely sure, but it looks like they're going to, they're going to sort of flap back and act like a, like an arrow break. So it's going to, okay. so it, as it's returning from the, from the atmosphere, it's going to be flying kind of sideways, sort of like the, with the way the space shuttle does. And yeah. those will fold back to give it a, like a center of balance that is, that keeps it a, oriented a as it's, yeah, a better profile as it's, as it's coming down. And then as it slows down to the point that it is, it can then switch to a propulsive landing and then it's going to um, sort of change its position and then, and then land propulsively. And so originally they thought it was going to land on three wings with like landing legs on the ends of them. But now there's going to be like six 
little feet at the bottom of the starship and then it's going to land on those as opposed to these these wings but the wings will probably like move up and down a bit and and flap so so one malachi is about to threaten to eat somebody hold on let me rescue i'll be right back (laughs) sure um get in here Why a third dog? Wait a minute, you have a third dog? We we have a foster dog who who keeps trying to eat the graduate student who's currently crashing in our spare bedroom. So let's meet um, the third dog. Yeah. So come here, Malachi. Come here. Hi, you are not Malachi. I know. I know. <laughs> come here. So this is Malachi. You can see the two heads. Let me see. Hold on. Let me see. Let me. Here. Let me. That's two heads on a dog? That's a little weird. I can't well, see him. Can you get him to come up? We can't really quite see him. Come here. Come here. Come on up. I know, Eddie. You can't. Hold on. Your phone's. Come on. I know. I know. You're going to melt into a liquid. Come here. Come here. <laughs> All right. Well, while, while she's attempting. <laughs> this is. Nope. So he has this amazing capacity to melt into a liquid. Yeah, I could see this was not going. This is not going <laughs> well. So I. Uh, but I... Uh, whoa! Oh, dang it! How did that happen? Can you still hear me? I can still hear you, but I can't see you. Yeah, switching cameras. I apparently unplugged something. Uh, FaceTime. Start video. There you go. You're back. So. All right. There is Eddie and Malachi. There you go. So Malachi has He's got one a lot of blue eye. A lot of brown on his face. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's a beautiful dog. He's just terrified of men. Something really, really bad happened to him at some point. Um, so he spent six months uh sorry he spent three months lost in the woods between a bunch of farms up near peoria the farmers finally caught him he was at the shelter for nine months and he's a two and a half year old dog so this two hundred two and a half year old dog spent a year of his life without humans and i don't know what badness occurred beforehand that he had to escape from but um yeah, he's terrified of skinny men and uh, attempted to chomp our instro. Oh. So. How, uh, how long do you expect he's going to be hanging out with you? Um, so we're trying to find an adoptive family that uh, is um, all women. Mm-hmm. So if he tries to chomp, uh, it will only be on unwanted guests. Right. So, <laughs> uh, we, has he, we has he a... gone after your husband or? No. So he's, he's okay with overweight men. <laughs> um, he uniquely hates skinny men. Right. More tests are required, I think. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's true. Uh, so. how to do stuff with Ethan asked, would a cloud of stuff be able to form two binary planets? Uh, Probably not because there just isn't enough mass to collapse down and fragment like that as far as our models know. But as this whole episode was pointed out, we really... <laughs> yeah, right. Come on. Like, you're going to make predictions with models? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but no, like, in terms of, like, say you've got a a planet, like, instead of one planet, couldn't you have a binary planet in orbit around a star? That that you can do. Okay. So binary planets. Pluto, Charon counts. Yeah. Moon, Earth, to some people, counts. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that can happen. <laughs> everyone said, everyone, Bill Sykvin says, everyone wants to chomp our instro. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, oh, poor our instro poor visited instro right after malachi came to join us and i uh, he got warning bit four or five different times and it was just like he was being so nice he was trying so hard and he was throwing himself at this foster dog checking out situation in ways that were yep. wonderful and um 
Malachi was just like, no, yeah, you cannot be in my space. I shall jump you. Yeah, our our dog Ona, you know, she same same situation found on the yeah. streets of Oakland, and she's an absolutely sweet dog. You know, uh, would you know would love both, uh, you know, loves both men and women. But if you move towards her with something that looks like a stick, oh yeah, she immediately sort of cowers or or tries to get away like like you can see that you know someone probably yeah. uh hit her and yeah. and so you can just sort of sense that but i mean she's such a loving dog that yeah that we don't have that that issue at all so um but it's a it's such a like there's so many dogs out there that need homes mm -hmm. and and it <clears throat> and you have to parent the dog that you get and yeah. and I, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends who have rescued dogs and they're six years in and they're finally building the level of trust and bond with their dog that that the dog is able to not be anxious all the time and not have yeah. these kinds of like it's you can really I mean, it's such a huge commitment to be able to take on a dog like that and be able to to give them the love and and care and stability that they require and yeah. it's a you know so i have huge uh just i'm super impressed by anybody who is willing to put in that kind of time you know here it's carla right yeah i get i just get the uh i get the side benefits of a of having a fun dog but she's the one there brushing her teeth and you know um so uh okay right so people are asking about your window shade <laughs> so i uh, Last last episode, uh, several people suggested that I should replace my overly bright window that is always behind me, always ruining my light yeah. with a green screen. And so what I did, and let me see if I can turn it off. I, I went to Michael's and I purchased uh, two pieces of green foam board. Right. And I, I'm simply sticking. I can, I can have San Francisco off in the background. <laughs> um, so I'm using the built-in features. I can have giant, terrifying grass in the background. So, but go back to that Starfield, because I actually think you. Yeah, I love the Starfield. You, but back you there. have like stumbled onto something, right? Like, is this yeah. a Kickstarter? Couldn't someone make a uh, make I don't know what material it would have to be, but could you make a blackout curtain that is just the right thickness, that has just the right fabric to make it look like a star field where the dots of light are the sun poking through to make little, little light. So like what we're seeing on your screen, it, you know, if we didn't know that it was a green screen, you would think yeah. that it was, that it was like dots of light poking through some kind of fabric to make it look mm -hmm. like a star field. I wonder if that's like physically possible to make something like that. It, it is. The question is, uh, how long would it take for it to cease to function? Because I, I'm thinking in my head of all the times that I've had blackout shades that got pinpricks in them yeah. and looked like that because I hated them. Um, yeah. and, it's it's the everything becomes more brittle and and yeah. fragile as it's getting hit by ultraviolet light so here you're looking at something that already has the decay process started with those pin pricks yeah um but, but yeah for now i'm totally happy with my uh seven dollars of filter. yeah i'm kind of tempted to to do the same oh, you know failed. like if i've got a uh, i've got a great big window right over here um People always give me a you know a hard time that that they always think that we're shooting in front of a green screen. So, um, and we don't. No. <laughs> so that's no. pretty funny. Anyway, I, I I think that's wonderful. That's just great. Um, Sergusi asks, uh, which of Saturn's moons are tidally locked to Jupiter? None. No, no, the the big four are. Saturn's moons tidally oh, locked tidally, to Jupiter. Did, you know, Jupiter's, <laughs> did I see Saturn's moon? Which of Jupiter's moons are tidally locked to Jupiter? How did I see Saturn? Anyway. I don't no. know, but it was, yeah. I was like, is this a trick question? <laughs> is this a trick question? question? <laughs> yeah. 
Ha ha! The airplane landed on the on the border between Canada and the United States. Um, so which of them are uh, are locked I, to Jupiter? It's, it's so the ones that are in resonance, which are what really matter, are are the Galilean moons, where we're looking at Io, Callista, Ganymede, and Europa. Right. So they're they're tidally locked, so that. And I can't remember off the top of my head the order that they are away, but the innermost one will go around, I think it's four times, uh, and the, for every one time the outermost one goes around. It may not be that neat, but it's yeah. it's these resonances of whole number intervals between the uh, orbital times of each of the worlds. Right. Um... Paul Gracie asks, what hypothesized orbital dynamics brought the material of supernovae and the formation of our own relatively low metal sun in close enough proximity for us to exist? Oh, our sun is hugely metallistic. Yeah. Yeah, we have a really, really metal rich star, like unusually metal rich star. And so, so with, and, and us does, having planets is, is not a curiosity. And so does that then feed back into our unreasonable expectations for finding planets that we did did so there i don't think so so much i uh, because people were largely speculating that planets were most likely rare could be incredibly common uh but the speculation was more of if you have the stuff to make planets one of the very first questions looked at once we started to find planets was the metallicity of the stars and lo and behold more metals more planets mm -hmm. well we're sort of reaching the end of our hour um so thanks everybody for uh taking the time to hang out with us today a big thanks to the moderators uh who were hard at work today um in the in the chat if you haven't already, the discussion that's going on down here, uh, that's all over on the Weekly Space Hangout Crews uh, Slack channel. So if you want to be a part of that, go to uh, wshcrew.space and you can join in. When is the next thing that you're going to be broadcasting, producing, making? What comes next? I, so the, the very next thing is I'm going to be painting on my personal Twitter stream, not Twitter, Twitch stream on Sunday and Annie doing the Sunday Science Hour. All of our channels take Saturdays off. Um, Elad Avron said that we are good Jews, despite us not being, it's just how it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so tune in for Annie at 1 PM Eastern, 10 AM Pacific, 6 PM London time on Cosmic Quest X on Twitch. And then I'm going to do the astronomy cast office hours at 2 PM for people who are patrons. And at roughly 3.30 Central, 4.30 Eastern, math the rest, I will be painting planets um, over on Star Strider. Right on. Um, uh, our episode for the Guide to Space, our next one is all about feeding 1 million humans on Mars, which I'm sure you saw that, that release yeah. come out this week. So we did a video on that, and that should be out within a few hours. I think it's ending up being a little gnarlier than, than Chad was expecting. So um, it's keeping us a little busy. Uh, and then of course, I mentioned this before on Monday, I will be interviewing uh, Professor Sean Carroll and talking about magic. So. And all of you need to go make plans for International Observe the Moon Night on October 5th. So yes. prepare to go out and spend your Saturday looking up. That sounds great. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you all next week. Goodbye. And now I need to find buttons. All right.